The case of Evans versus Snyder kicks off, where Mr. Evans disputes paternity of a two-month-old daughter, Lainey, claiming their relationship was a brief fling. He is adamant he is not the father, and expresses a strong desire to reclaim his last name once proven. The saga is just heating up, so don't go anywhere. This is a case of Evans versus Snyder. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Mr. Evans, you claim your relationship with the defendant was just a week-long fling, and you are certain you are not the biological father of her two-month-old daughter, Lainey. Once today's result prove what you already know, you want your last name back. Are you ready for this curveball? Mrs. Snyder counters with a firm belief that Mr. Evans is indeed Lainey's father, emphasizing his need for involvement in Lainey's life and her expectation that today's DNA test will settle the matter once and for all. Buckle up, because the twists keep coming. You claim today's DNA test will prove that the plaintiff is Lainey's father, and you need him to step up and help support your daughter. So, Mr. Evans, you say you're certain this is not your child. I'm absolutely. Just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, Mr. Evans vehemently denies paternity, pointing out that the baby shares none of his distinctive features, like his nose and eyes. He states he's ready to step up if proven wrong, but remains steadfast in his conviction that he's not the father. What unfolds next will surely keep you on the edge of your seat. The baby doesn't look like me for, from the get-go. Like, as soon as I saw her, I was just like, she don't look like me. She's, she doesn't have my nose, she doesn't have my eyes. Like, I would see, you know, features, you know, that would re resemble me. She doesn't look anything like me. So I just want to know. I mean, if she is mine, then okay, you know, I'll, I'll man up and take care of my take care of my little girl. But if she's not mine, then I want my name back. Things are about to get even more emotional. Ms. Snyder, visibly upset, articulates the pain caused by Mr. Evans's denial of paternity. She speaks passionately about her deep bond with her daughter and her frustration at the ongoing dispute. The emotional roller coaster is far from over, so hang tight for the next revelation. What are you feeling in this moment right now? Emotional and kind of sad because it's just overwhelming right now. So today truly means everything to you. This is important. Yes, Your Honor. This is the day that you feel like you're going to get a father for your baby. Yes, Your Honor. The father she deserves. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Evans recounts the peculiar way he met Ms. Snyder during a street performance, which quickly escalated into an unexpectedly wild and public flirtation. This jaw-dropping tale sets the stage for even more eyebrow-raising details to follow. So I was downtown playing drum. So she walks up to me and I see her and she's, you know, looking at me and I'm just like, and then she starts, you know, dancing a little bit and then starts flashing her boobs. And no, I, I did like, it. What? Yes, she did. <laughs> That's why. She starts dancing on top of me. Like, she's no. literally in my lap while I'm playing drums. And while she's dancing no. on top of me while I'm playing drums by like, oh, Bye. entertaining and whatnot. This is great. She's making me more money because people are <laughs> putting more money in my bucket. As if it couldn't get any more bizarre, the story spirals as Mr. Evans describes a spontaneous and chaotic threesome with Mr. Snyder and his ex-girlfriend, filled with impromptu decisions and risque antics. Just when you think you've heard it all, the next part of the story adds even more spice. So then I get a phone call from my ex saying that she's at my house right now. She brought a guy over because he lost his job. He needed a place to stay. It was the only place that she can think of to bring him. And I'm just like, okay, you know what, fine. But this girl dancing on my lap right now, and I'm bringing her home. You didn't home, say that so. part. <laughs> oh my God. You didn't say that part. I did too say that. I told you what you happened said. right after that, right after I got off the phone. This part is key to the timeline puzzle. As the court digs deeper, Mr. Evans elaborates on the week they spent together, emphasizing their reckless and unprotected encounters, which he believes did not lead to conception. But the plot thickens, and what's next is crucial. I can't move on from this point until I say, now you know you don't have no business. Plan drum out there on the street then coming back home with some woman Whoa. and not using protection and you don't have no business coming home with him and not using no protection. Yes, sir. I understand that now. This update changes everything. Ms. Wu Snyder drops the bombshell of her pregnancy while Mr. Evans is out of state, introducing doubts about the timing and paternity given their brief fling and her later interactions with another man. The drama escalates rapidly, leading to a pivotal moment just ahead. Take me to the day you find out Ms. Snyder is Pregnant. Okay, so I'm in Colorado at this point working and she calls me like between it was like in between July and August of, of 2018 I get a phone call from her and she told me that she was pregnant So, you know, when do you find out when the baby's born and you know, what's the sex and everything? And so she told me it, it's possibly a girl and she's due sometime in January so or December the courtroom is buzzing with anticipation. A detailed analysis of the conception window is laid out based on the timeline of their sexual encounters. This analysis hints that Mr. Evans might actually be the father, despite all his doubts. Stay tuned, because the DNA test results are about to make a big splash. You had sex with the other guy, the 22nd through the 28th. If you do the calculation, the window of conception would have been around the end of March to the first week 
of April. Do you to believe that Mr. Evans, Laney's biological father? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Evans is the only man you were sleeping with during that time? Yes, Your Honor. Because you didn't meet him until the first. Yes, Your Honor. The verdict is in. Are you ready for this? The DNA test results are unveiled. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Evans, you are not the father. You were right, Mr. Evans. You are not her biological father. Can you even handle what's going on? Miss Brown is here today slapping her mom with a lawsuit for a whopping $2,200, blaming her for the emotional roller coaster caused by not knowing her real dad. Now, the court's got its detective hat on, deciding if there's enough juice to squeeze a paternity test out of one potential pops. Just when you think you've seen it all, the next twist comes along. Miss Brown, you're here today suing your mother for $2,200 for emotional distress. You say she's caused you by not knowing who your biological father is. Now, the court the court has located one possible father and must determine is enough evidence to order a paternity test. Hold on to your coffee, folks. Miss Brown drops a bombshell with a list her mom gave her, six to seven names long, of guys who might be her dad. Turns out the first dude they tested could have starred in Not the Father, the way Maury Povich likes to announce. This roller coaster of daddy issues just cranked up a notch. You'll want to stick around for what's up next. We want the truth in this courtroom. My mom was not, she wasn't there as much as she should have been there. I asked her on several occasions. Do you know who my father could be? My mama just said, I don't know. Every time I asked, it was, I don't know, I don't know. Actually, I have a list of men. It's about six or seven guys. 67? About six or seven. I said, wait a minute now. <laughs> OK. You couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. Miss Brown spills the beans about her rocky childhood, bouncing around foster homes, all thanks to the mystery of her dad's identity. She even had to drop out in the ninth grade to look after her sick grandma, because, you know, life wasn't tough enough. Hold tight, because the emotional floodgates are about to open even wider. I was in and out of foster care on three different occasions. Foster care wasn't so good, you know. I had, I didn't know where they were. They got split up too. My grandmother got us back. She got sick. I missed three months of school, got kicked out. I was in alternative school. I got kicked out because my grandma got sick and I had to take care of her. This is straight out of a daytime drama. Miss Brown Overstreet, the mother in the hot seat, confesses to her messy parenting skills, chalked up to her wild youth and a missing manual on motherhood. She's got regrets and admits to flunking out when her kids needed her most. The saga deepens, so don't go anywhere. The confessions are just getting started. I had my kids young and it was six, I have six of them. So it wasn't like it was just one child. I had a hard time trying to be a mother. I didn't know how to raise my kids and when I lost custody of them, I tried my best to get, I can admit that I was young and I was wild and I was kind of promiscuous, so I did not know who her father was. Did you approach any of those men and say, I'm pregnant and I think you're the father, or you just left them all alone? I just left them all alone. This hits right in the feels. Miss Brown paints a picture of a childhood missing crucial pieces, a father's guidance, and a mother's steady presence. Her brother became her makeshift parent, teaching her everything from bike riding to spelling. The plot thickens, and you won't believe what's coming next. A little of some of what she was supposed to, but I guess she felt that giving me money erased all the past memories that I had because of her. She used to give me money all the time. Money, money don't pay. Money is not going to pay for what I went through. I was tormented. You say you were tormented. Tormented. Living without your father. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And your mother. Yes, Your Honor. Just when you think it's all out on the table, Mr. Smith, a new contender for Father of the Year, recounts his surprise debut at Miss Brown's workplace, which might as well have had a spotlight and dramatic music. His tale of mistaken intentions and awkward first impressions adds another layer to this family feud. The twists keep coming, so keep Keep your eyes peeled. We go back a long time. So when I called her, she was like that she was trying to find father of our daughter. I said, wouldn't it be funny if I was the father? And she was like, oh yeah, I forgot all about you. <laughs> I'm like, you forgot all about me. Then I was adding up the days. If I have a child out there, I want to know. I get out the car and my cousin pointed her out. So I was looking at her. So she came up and I said something to her first and she was smiling at me like I'm like, like, like I was trying to flirt with her or something. So I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, here, I might be your father. You busy trying to flirt with me. Ever heard a story twist like a pretzel? Here's Mr. Smith with a doozy about a childhood injury that might have put him on the bench in the baby-making league. But biology's funny that way, and the possibility he's the dad is still in play. The stakes are high, and you'll want to see how this plays out. You know, I really didn't, because like I said, I tried to stand up right then and there. And I had to just be a man about the whole thing and take care of my responsibility. And that's just, that's why I'm here. You know, take care of what's mine, that's all. Good, that's good to hear. 
You stated in your court papers, though, that you have reason to have doubt. Oh. And you just stated in court today that she had a boyfriend during the time you slept with her. Oh, yes, um... Grab your popcorn for this bit. Dr. Gator steps up with a medical mic drop, saying despite Mr. Smith's cringeworthy injury, the man could still be shooting live rounds. This pivotal expert insight could change everything for Miss Brown, setting the stage for a paternity test showdown. The tension's building, and you're gonna want to see the result. Dr. Gator is from the Rise Men's Medical Clinic, and she's a board-certified family medical <laughs> physician. Hi, Dr. Gator. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us. You've reviewed the evidence in this case. Mr. Smith contends that he had a serious injury, and the doctor told him he may not be able to have children because of this. All right, let's get ready to rumble. The court calls for a DNA test to finally put to rest whether Mr. Smith is the dad or just another chapter in this saga. This is the part where we all lean in, because after all this buildup, the truth is about to be laid bare. Get ready for the reveal. It's a doozy. The court is going to order a DNA test and order you to submit to that test so we can get this young woman the answers she deserves. Jerome, please escort them out of the courtroom. We're gonna head to the lab immediately. <laughs> We're back in session in the case of Brown versus Brown Overstreet. Welcome back, everyone. And here it comes, the big reveal. DNA results are in. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Smith, you are not Shantia's father. I'm sorry. Can you believe what just unfolded? Miss Browning and her grandmother, totally fed up with not knowing the real deal, are banking on today's court results to finally shed some light on her dad's identity. They're crossing their fingers for a result that not only confirms who her dad is, but also patches up their father-daughter bond and kicks off some much-needed healing. Mr. Browning admits to being on the birth certificate since he was hitched to Miss Browning's mom when she was conceived, but he's tossing out the idea of being the bio dad due to their split at the time. And just when you think you've got a grip on the drama, wait till you hear what's coming up next. Browning, you and your grandmother have believed the defendant to be your biological father. You say that you are tired of his uncertainty and denial and hope that when today's results reveal the truth, it will strengthen your father-daughter relationship. You state you are Ms. Browning's legal father because you were married to her mother during the time of conception. You were no longer in an intimate relationship with her mother. It is impossible for you to be her biological father. Hold on to your seats. This next bit is a doozy. As the court drama unfolds, Mr. Browning is sticking to his guns about not being the biological father, hinting that another guy might have been in the picture when his marriage was on the rocks. He tells a tale of a love lost and a relationship that was all but over before Miss Browning was even a twinkle in her mother's eye. Meanwhile, his own mother throws a curveball into the mix, swearing she saw things that would make a soap opera blush. Buckle up because the family fireworks are just getting started. Uh, your assertion you're the legal father only. Yes, Your Honor. Explain that to the court, please. I'm the legal father of Tiffany, Your Honor. Because at the time of Tiffany's conception, Your Honor, I was still married to, but I'm not biologically the father. I believe the father is another man. I heard he was a drifter. Your Honor, what does it matter, Your Honor? What does it matter? I, I raised her. I took her to school. I went to the ball games with her. I went to her graduation. What does it matter, Your Honor? You might want to sit down for this bombshell. In a twist that could turn any family dinner awkward, Miss Browning's grandma stands up in court to contradict her son's denial of paternity. She's adamant she saw enough romantic rendezvous at her place to make her head spin, placing Mr. Browning right at the scene of the conception. The courtroom is buzzing with mixed testimonies that blur the lines between past and present, and you won't want to miss what's thrown into the mix next. She said there was another man. She said he was adrift. So she admitted in, in, in a previous court proceeding we're not the biological father and that this other man she met during the separation was. But I was there. I never heard, I was there in court. I never heard Rose say it. That's, that's not true. That's a lie, Gray. She said it. And Your Honor, my name is not on the birth certificate, Your Honor. She never filed child support, Your Honor, because she never felt I was the father. This next part is heart-wrenching. Grab some tissues. Miss Browning dives into the deep end of her childhood memories, revealing the bombshell about her dad's paternity dropped during a heated family squabble when she was just 12. The scars of that revelation, it seems, dug deep, leaving more questions than answers about who she really is. The emotional roller coaster is far from over, so keep those tissues handy because things are about to get even more tear-jerking. She never, never accepted me. I have never, I have never, I actually saw many times they lived in my house seven days a week. How does your son's denial make you feel? You say you know. How does it make you feel to hear him deny Tiffany? It makes me feel sad. It makes me feel sad. 
And it's not for me, it's for her. Right. Things are heating up with some medical mysteries. Evidence is thrown into the mix, showing that both Miss Browning and Mr. Browning share a few quirky health issues, asthma, diabetes, and a pesky shellfish allergy. Could the genes be trying to tell us something after all? The court listens to experts dissecting whether these medical ties are just coincidence or clues to a familial connection. As the plot thickens, brace yourself. The truth bomb is just about to drop. Have you read up to the witness, Stanley? Dr. Brown Parks, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. First, I want to ask you, Dr. Brown Parks, how does asthma develop? So, asthma is a constrictive airway disease. And when we're talking about the father with asthma, the chances of having a child diagnosed with asthma also, a father who has it, is two and a half to three times, depending on the age of diagnosis. And here it is, the grand finale everyone's been waiting for. In a courtroom packed with tension, the envelope with the DNA results is finally opened. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Browning, you are not oh. the father. Okay. I'm so sorry. Buckle up, we're starting with a bang. Ms. Percival kicks off by claiming her supposed dad, Mr. Hansen, has never recognized her as his daughter in all of 31 years. Mr. Hansen snaps back, utterly denying paternity, insisting there's no way she's his. And just like that, the courtroom's already sizzling with drama. Ms. Percival, you say for the past 31 years, your father has never been willing to accept you as his biological daughter. Now, Mr. Hansen, you claim you did not sleep with Ms. Percival's mother at the time she was conceived, and there is no way she is your daughter. Here's where it gets juicy. Just when you thought one paternity claim was enough, there's another woman outside, also claiming Mr. Hansen is her father. Inside, Miss Percival spills her heart out about feeling rejected all her life, being the sibling who was never acknowledged. You'll want to stick around because the pot is about to stir even more. There is yet another young woman waiting outside of the courtroom claiming Mr. Hansen is her father. I feel like he's rejected me since, well, my whole life I've grown up not knowing who my father was. Also through my mother, who is Michael's daughter. He accepted her when she was a baby, but denied me the whole entire time. Hold your popcorn. Things are heating up. Judge Lake dives into the whys and hows as Mr. Hansen reveals he was juggling relationships at the supposed time of conception. He paints himself as Mr. Faithful, claiming it's impossible for him to be the father. Don't go anywhere. The courtroom's temperature is about to rise. I was with the woman 20 years, never cheated on. You're in a marriage. You say you never cheated on your wife. Yeah, that's right. Within a month of the time that Ms. Percival was born. I was with the other woman. Can you feel the tension? Ms. Percival recounts the limited interaction with Mr. Hansen, painting a picture of a dad who's practically a stranger. As accusations fly about Mr. Hansen's fidelity, he staunchly denies overlapping relationships. But wait, the plot thickens in the next moment. No, I barely met him personally two months ago at Teresa's house. We're gonna get to that story in a moment. That's right. proven right there that you were She's but the one that he was cheated still on me. Cheater. We were with both women at the same time. No, I wasn't. All right. You won't believe this twist. Enter Ms. Vile Pando with her take on Mr. Hansen's dubious paternity stance. She reveals a tangled web of liaisons and possible deceptions, challenging Mr. Hansen's narrative of loyalty. The revelations are far from over, so keep watching. It's getting wild in here. His contention That's... is that he was married and he never cheated. Never no. cheat on Tracy. Your He's daughters are one month apart. He, in fact, was going yes. back. Yes. Back, Your Honor. And no. he is the father. Grab a seat if you haven't already. Mr. Hansen drops a bombshell, claiming ignorance of Ms. Percival's existence until she was in her teens, contradicting the mother's story. As they argue over family resemblances and histories, you'll want to see what explosive info comes out next. And were you clear with him when you were pregnant, this is your child? Yes. She wasn't. don't even look like me. I look like Jessica and I look like Teresa. And Jessica for sure is your kid? Yeah, Jessica's okay, mine, and yeah. Okay, and we, we look mine. identical. Did we you ever ask him for a DNA test? No, because I never seen him around. You thought that was shocking? As we edge closer, Closer to the climax, Ms. Hansen and Ms. Merchant enter the fray, adding layers to the already convoluted family saga. Their testimonies promise to add more sparks to the fiery debate. The next turn is sure to drop some jaws. And Jerome, could you please Ms. Hansen and Ms. Merchant into the courtroom? Have you go to the podium on the left too? Really? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. I can't wait for the child support. Huh? <laughs> Hold on one second before you say what you have to say. State your name for the court. Tracy, Tracy. Merchant. You're Ms. Merchant, and your name? I'm Tracy Hansen. Fasten your seatbelts for an emotional roller coaster. As Ms. Percival and Mr. Hansen delve into the profound impacts of his absence, the courtroom is drenched in emotion. With Mr. Hansen still doubting the paternity, the upcoming DNA results are eagerly anticipated. This is going to be a revelation you don't want to miss. No. 
I, I hear one thing are. and I hear another. So, I mean, they're both as far as I'm concerned. He's my father, so it's both of my parents right now because I don't know. But no matter what. I need answers. No matter what, she's going to be I my daughter. Answers. No matter the outcome. No matter the outcome. If she's my daughter, I'll take full responsibility. Here comes the grand finale. DNA results are in, and they're about to flip the script. When it comes to the paternity of Ms. Percival, Mr. Hansen, you are her father. <laughs> no way. Miss Yarbrough previously proved in court that Credle Jones, a member of the Chai Lights, was her biological father. Now she's teaming up with her brother, Michael Jones, in a new courtroom drama to prove that Mr. Triplett is not their sibling, aiming to protect their father's precious musical legacy and estate. Things are just heating up. Wait till you see what's next. In this very courtroom to prove that the late Chai Lights member Creed L. Jones, your biological father, Michael Jones, is your brother. The results from that case prove that Creed L. Jones, your father. Stand united together to protect your father's legacy and musical estate, proving that Mr. Triplett not your sibling. All right, let's dive into this juicy bit. Mr. Triplett is throwing a curveball, claiming Cradell Jones is his dad and hoping for a warm welcome from Miss Yarbrough and Mr. Jones after the DNA test results are in. Mr. Jones is skeptical because of their age difference and his parents' seemingly rock-solid relationship during his early years. Stay tuned, the plot thickens, and it's about to get even spicier. You've always known that Mr. Cradell Jones is your father and you hope that once the DNA results are revealed, Ms. Yarbrough and Mr. Jones will welcome you with open arms. Yes, you are. Why do you doubt Mr. Triplett is your brother? He claims that he's like two weeks older than me. As far as my life, I know my mother and father was always together. Hold on to your seats, folks. Mr. Jones is standing his ground, sharing that his father signed his and his brother's birth certificates, firmly disputing Mr. Triplett's sibling claim, who lacks similar proof on his own birth document. As the tension builds in the courtroom, prepare for the atmosphere to get even more electrifying. My father was there, my mother was there. My dad signed his name on my birth certificate. So you're saying growing up, you were the oldest child? Yes, 50 years. You say your father older. signed your birth certificate, both of which list Creed L. A. Jones as father. Now, this is getting interesting. Mr. Triplett shares some sparse yet poignant memories of Cradell Jones, who seemed more like a mysterious figure than a dad, complicating his claims even further. As he lays out his sporadic interactions, we're about to see how these puzzle pieces fit into the larger family drama. You won't want to miss what comes next. I've only met him twice. The first memory of meeting him, I was kind of pat me on the head, handed me $100 and went up to talk with my mom. Came, but this time my relatives were there, spoke with my relatives. They knew and I was able to recognize from the first time that I met him that was the guy that my mom pointed out to me was my father. Here's a twist you didn't see coming. Miss Yarbrough recounts her own courtroom saga of proving her paternity and voices doubts about Mr. Triplett's motives, hinting at a potential cash grab due to the estate's value. But hold your horses. There's more to this story. Watch how it unfolds. Did you ever hear that in addition to yourself, there were other children? I mean, the only ones that I've heard of were Kubi when I got here, but I've never heard of him. I don't know where he come from. Now here we are again, you know, somebody claiming that they're you know, rifle heir or whatever. And then, I mean, if you are, that's fine. And now for a bit of expert wisdom. Mr. Fred Bugs chimes in with his take on Cradell Jones's lucrative music legacy, hinting at the potential for numerous unrecognized claims stemming from the free-spirited 70s lifestyle of musicians. As we digest this expert insight, the stakes are about to go through the roof. We are here on another paternity matter connected to Cradell Jones of the Shy Light. Can you shed light on that for us? Sure can. You had a couple of great stand-up singing groups during the 70s. Shy Lights out of Chicago. Bunch of number one songs that has been done throughout the years. Publishing has got to be well into the million. Feel the tension as secrets start to unravel. Mr. Jones opens up about his quest to connect with his father's legacy, shedding light on the emotional roller coaster that comes with uncovering familial truths from Cradell Jones's past relationships. The anticipation is mounting, and the big reveal is just around the corner. I haven't seen my dad since I was three years old, 1970. Two, featuring one of the Shy Lights members. And that magazine read the article and thought about Dad. Was he still alive? An email to their PR agency telling her who I was. I haven't seen my father. Later that day, I get an email back telling me she sent the email to Marshall. He asked her for me to send a picture. He wanted to see me. So I took a picture, snapped it, sent it to him. Then today, your lucky day. The moment of truth is almost here. Can you feel it? As the court prepares to disclose the DNA results, the emotional stakes are sky high, especially for Mr. Triplett, who is desperate for closure on his paternity mystery. Brace yourself for a heart-stopping revelation that could change everything. Is that he was told that this was his 
file, real contact or connection with him. He didn't really pursue the relationship, but instead did what a lot of young people say, my courtroom. Well, if he didn't really care enough to have a relationship with me, then I just go on with my life and try to do me. But as he got, he began to think, well, I really don't want to leave this earth without knowing who my father is. Get ready for a groundbreaking moment. The DNA results confirm that. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Triplett, Ms. Yarbrough, Mr. Irving Jones, Mr. Michael Jones, you are related. Oh. Can you believe we just started and it's already this juicy? Miss White opens her case by stating her need to prove the paternity of her three-year-old daughter, Savannah, to her husband. She admits to previous infidelities and hopes that confirming Savannah's paternity will mend their fractured trust. Hold on to your seats because this roller coaster is just taking off. You've opened your case because the only way to save your marriage and family is to prove to your husband that three-year-old daughter, Savannah. Yes, yeah, sure. You admit you've cheated in the past, but husband will trust you again. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. The tension is mounting. Mr. White dives into the painful doubts that have plagued their marriage, fueled by neighborhood gossip and his own social media sleuthing. The emotional strain has escalated the marital discord to breaking point. And guess what? It thickens even further up next. Because when it first all come about to where she was having an ex-boyfriend, I had neighbors tell me he was coming over, and then I started doing the snooping on Facebook, seeing where his location was, and then we got into an argument one night. He showed up, and that's when I knew there was something half call him if we're arguing. And the plot thickens. Miss White reveals the deeper reasons behind her infidelity, citing abandonment issues due to her adoption. Desperate for more affection and public acknowledgement from her husband, she lays her emotional cards on the table. The emotional ante is upped even more in the following testimony. But I have like abandonment issues. He's not showing me the love and affection that I need. I'm trying to like make excuses for myself because I admit what I've done is wrong. Love and affection and be there for me. And he's not doing. But well, wait a minute. Because you admittedly have been cheating, you've had to open this case to Correct. prove paternity of Savannah in hopes of saving your marriage. This segment is a real eye opener. They discuss how quickly their relationship progressed to marriage and parenthood. A world wind of young love and overwhelming responsibilities. The complexities only deepen as we peel back more layers in the upcoming moments. I moved in with them after a month of being together. I ended up getting pregnant with our first child. We ended up getting married. Everything just happened so quickly at 19 years old. So. You got married young? Yes. Did you start cheating? Yes. I didn't find out for sure. Admittedly told me when Savannah was six months old, 50 chance that Savannah wasn't mine. This is where it gets real. The conversation turns to how their rocky marriage marriage impacts their children, with Mr. White stressing the importance of a stable, loving home, whether together or apart. But hold your breath, because the next part reveals just how complicated their relationship has become. And at the same time, I, it was kind of a re relief because for a fact that it was actually happening, it wasn't just, oh, it's an assumption, I don't know. I, I think more than anything that I was more hurt. Done got attached to her, six months old, was there for the whole nine months. I was the one that cut the, I've been there for all my kids. I work to provide for my kids because I want them to have a better life than I did. You won't believe what's coming up next. Miss White's ongoing infidelity is starkly highlighted through damning text messages to an ex-boyfriend, further exposing the depth of her betrayal. The emotional fallout is about to explode. Watch how it unravels. Why are you texting your ex-boyfriend these things? He don't treat me right. Like Your body is naked wishing you were in the bed. Which bed? Your husband's bed? Yeah. You submitted another text message? Oh, this is another guy. This is not the ex-boyfriend's name. Oh. Laying here horny, and you say, Miss White, I know me too. And then you forgot the other O on two. <laughs> just when you thought it couldn't escalate further. The court reviews additional evidence of Miss White's infidelity, including more revealing text messages that underline the severe discord and her disregard for the marriage. The repercussions of these discoveries lead to an explosive revelation just around the corner. Why are you entertaining all these men on tech? Because he doesn't show me anything. Always with the pivot. He's not there for Always me. Always pivoting, you're trying to put it off on me. How you expect me to treat you the way you want to be treated when you're sitting here sexting other people and doing all for my money to take care of the kids because every time that I threaten to kick you on the marriage. We're not saying that you want to go see every time, Dick. And Grab some tissues for this one. Mr. White painfully recounts how he confronted Miss White about her infidelity, leading to a heart-wrenching discussion about the doubts surrounding their child's paternity. The emotional impact of his testimony paves the way for a jaw-dropping conclusion. What you would call, she aspirates. When she drinks, she has to have it thick, and or half of it would go into her lungs. Been there through that, been there through everything, the difficulties that my other children 
children. I just love her. I can't, I don't know what I would do. I tried to leave this relationship, but she won't let me leave. I've stood in front of the car to where I couldn't leave or she says I'm gonna call the cops and tell them you hit me. Are you ready for this finale? In an emotionally charged climax, the paternity results are disclosed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. White, you are her father. What a wild way to kick things off. Ms. Henderson opens her case, explaining her lifelong uncertainty about her father's identity. She believed Mr. Henderson was her biological father until Mr. Rycraw claimed paternity when she was 15. She expresses her doubt and seeks the truth through the case. The suspense is just starting, and you'll want to see what happens next. You claim that Mr. Henderson was your biological father at the age of 15. Mr. Rycraw, he is your dad. You are doubtful and have opened today's case to get the truth. Hold on to your coffee because here comes a heart wrencher. Ms. Henderson discusses the emotional toll of not knowing her father, impacting both her and her children who are curious about their grandparents. She expresses a deep desire for familial connection and closure, highlighting her readiness to learn the truth about her paternity. Get ready because the emotional roller coaster is just getting going. My kids, they want to know their grandparents. My daughter, she tells me all the time, Mom, we're going to find your dad. I'm just ready. I want to be close to somebody, be close to them. Um, I've always been close to him, but I need to to know the truth. Strap in for this next revelation. Mr. Rycraw confidently states that he is Ms. Henderson's biological father. He shares his immediate emotional connection upon meeting her, supported by the aunt's belief in his paternity. Their conviction adds emotional weight to the proceedings as they seek confirmation from the court. The plot thickens, and you'll be on the edge of your seat. When we met, I just felt that she was my dog. And then just to know that my sister's resting in her grave, she needs to know who her family really is. I just need to know, too, for sure. We can all move on. Either way it go, he's been her father, and they're going to remain I'm being her father. Here. Things are getting spicy. Mr. Henderson recounts his marital difficulties and doubts about Ms. Henderson's paternity. Following his wife's extended trip, his narrative reveals suspicions of infidelity and the complex dynamics that led to the paternity question. You won't want to miss what's coming up next. She's left me in California, went to visit her mother in Arkansas. My other daughter told me that my mom is pregnant. And so when you find that out, she did or you assume this is my baby? She was pregnant before she left. I talked to her. I told her, if it's a girl, it's ours. If it's the boy, you gotta go. So you had an inkling, a suspicion. That it wasn't mine. Are you on the birth certificate? No. Grab your popcorn. This is a good one. Ms. Henderson describes her first meeting with Mr. Rycroft, arranged by her aunt, which was emotionally positive. However, her mother's later comments sow doubts, complicating her feelings and the narrative of her paternity. Things are about to take an even more dramatic turn. She told me to come meet my dad, and we held each other. I asked my mom after that about him. I don't know why William thinks he's your dad. The last time I was with him, I was 18, and I had you when I was 25. My sister, when it comes to telling the truth on certain things, they'll be around the bush. And like she didn't answer him when she came back, she didn't tell her the truth either. Here comes the juicy part. The episode deepens with revelations about family secrets and affairs, suggesting a tangled web of relationships and hidden truths surrounding Ms. Henderson's birth, adding layers to the paternity mystery. Brace for impact, because the revelations are just getting started. I'm tired of just beating around the bush, not saying nothing about it. So I went on and told her, do you want to meet your dad? So you called her that day. I want to meet his daughter. I called him, and he came to revival, and I said, you want to meet your daughter? You want to hear from you. What was that day like? Um, I'm just astonished about it. I believe she's my daughter. Karen went back to California. I believe she was that she was pregnant. Buckle up for this bombshell. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Henderson, you are not the father. Mr. Williams steps up with full confidence, asserting his unwavering belief that Quinesha Mayberry is his biological daughter, challenging the defendant's opposite claim. He's all in, hoping today's DNA results will slap a big confirmation on what he's been holding onto for 35 years. You won't believe what's coming up next. Mr. Williams, from the moment, Quinesha Mayberry, you believe that she is your biological daughter, even though the defendant claimed you hope today's results prove what you have known for 35 years. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. In a dramatic twist, Mr. Williams recounts that life-changing moment when he first laid eyes on Quinesha, instantly feeling a father-daughter bond based on their similar looks just a week after her birth. The court's about to heat up even more, so don't go anywhere. It was the first time I saw her. You know, she just, she looked like me, and I just, I just knew she was my daughter. Saturn, you said, this is my daughter. It felt like she looked... Well, she's fair-skinned. I was fair-skinned. Her mom is dark, and the other guy, he's darker. That's not a lot of crap. 
criteria. But I just felt and I felt it in my heart. And most babies are very pale when they're born. What? So you really did. You had yes. that feeling like this is my daughter. Yes. Just when you think you've heard it all, Miss Wynn challenges the paternity claim based on mere skin color resemblance, calling it weak sauce and reaffirming her knowledge of the actual dad. This courtroom drama is about to escalate. Watch out for what happens next. He's not her father, Your Honor. Color don't mean nothing, because he likes skin and other guys dark skin. That don't prove that he's her father. It sure doesn't. I know who's her father. I, it's it. not Stanley. You'll get a kick out of this. Mr. Williams dives into a backstory of their once close-knit friendship turned brief romantic fling, which Miss Wynn shockingly claims to have no recollection of. The surprises are just getting started. Wait till you see the reaction from the crowd. Just close friends that went wild. She used to come by where I used to work at probably 30, 40 times a day, just walking in front of the door to get my attention. <laughs> You know, we did mess around, but it was never a relationship. So how long did this sexual relationship last? Four or five months, something like that. How do you remember your relationship with Mr. Williams? Can you take me back? I don't remember. Get ready for a jaw dropper as Miss Wynn emphatically states she does not remember any romantic escapades with Mr. Williams, despite admitting she used to stroll by his store just to catch his eye. The story takes a wild turn soon, so keep your eyes peeled. No, Your Honor, I do not remember. <laughs> You remember walking past the store and trying to get his attention? So you remember both of you all were young and you or and you remember walking past trying to get his attention. She saw him probably about ten times a day. About That's what he said. Maybe, times a day. maybe more. And so what That's still he... don't prove he's the father. Can you handle more? Listen to Mr. Williams describe taking baby Quinesha to family gatherings, seeking his mother's confirmation of their resemblance. As emotions stir, anticipate even more revelations just around the corner. The first time I took her home to my mom and I asked my mom, I said, Do she look like me? And my mom said, yeah, that's your baby, Stan. How old was she? She was months old. I used to and go you get came her and picked up a newborn baby. Yes. And she wasn't no newborn. Yes. He ain't got no pictures with her being a newborn. It was once I came and got her for like my nieces and nephews birthday parties. I used to go get her so she can come and play with the other kids. And I would keep her the duration of the party. As emotions swirl, Quinisha speaks up about growing up without feeling a connection to the man on her birth certificate, intensifying the courtroom's atmosphere. The emotional stakes are high and there's more heart tugging drama ahead. Man, this time my birth certificate, met him like twice. I don't feel like we have a connection. I really don't feel like that's my father. And you've only seen him like two times. And that was when I was like 18. So back to her. I'm still mom and dad. You've been a mom and probably a really great mom here if you were the dad and could really fill those shoes. And just when you think it's all figured out, the DNA test results drop like a bomb. It has been determined by this court. Mr. William, you are not the father. This segment kicks off the case of Taylor versus Taylor. Mr. Taylor steps up, hopeful that the DNA test results will clear the air and resolve Jasmine Taylor's uncertainties about her paternity, paving the way for them to mend their fractured relationship. Ms. Jasmine Taylor, on the other hand, shares her deep-seated doubts about Mr. Taylor being her biological dad, doubts that were planted during her childhood by her mother's offhand remarks. Strap in because this emotional roller coaster is just taking off. Mr. Taylor, you claim that you always believe and never doubted that the defendant, Jasmine, Jasmine Taylor is your biological dog. You hope today's results will put an end to Jasmine's doubts so the two of you can work on rebuilding your relationship. Did that just happen? Ms. Taylor spills the beans, admitting to some pretty major blunders, like tossing out hurtful comments out of spite, which her daughter unfortunately overheard and took to heart. These admissions lay the groundwork for a full-blown investigation into the real paternity story, revealing Jasmine's years of doubt about her biological father. And guess what? The plot is about to thicken even more. Her daughter heard those words and believes Mr. Taylor is not her father. You state since you were five years old, you have doubted that Mr. Taylor is your biological father. Believe another man is your dad. And so, Ms. Taylor, you say you let something slip. Now you haven't been able to live it down. I made a mistake. I said something to Spike because he no longer wanted to be with me. So I was, and I did have a relationship with somebody else. I had sex with him one time. The courtroom tension just dialed up. Jasmine brings us into one of her earliest memories. Over overhearing a fiery argument where her mother blurted out that Mr. Taylor might not be her real father. This bombshell has haunted Jasmine, fueling her paternity doubts since she was five years old. Keep watching. The twists and turns are about to get wild. When I was younger, like around the age five, parents, they had got into an argument and I overheard it about her and my mother saying that, oh, well, that's not your daughter anyway. So ever since then, always wanted to know, like, who's my real father? Is this my father or not? And you remember distinctly here? Yes, definitely. I mean, I really wish I would have never 
ever said that? Things are heating up now. Ms. Taylor dives into the murky details surrounding Jasmine's conception, mentioning a brief fling with another man that casts a shadow of doubt over Mr. Taylor's paternity. This juicy bit of gossip adds layers of complexity to the case, highlighting the slim chance that someone else could be Jasmine's biological father. Hold tight, because the revelations are about to ramp up. I was like maybe four months when I realized I was pregnant, and my period has always been irregular. By the time that I realized that I was pregnant, I did sleep with the other guy, but I don't know. Times were you intimate with this other guy? Once, and then I moved to Merle. I was, next thing you know, he was taking me back to Merle. I always believed that he was the father. It's just that 5%. What 5%? I slept with the other guy. You won't see this coming. A look back reveals that during a particularly heated exchange, Ms. Taylor dropped a bombshell on Mr. Taylor, suggesting he might not be Jasmine's father. A comment brushed aside until financial issues like child support brought it back to the forefront. This throwback sheds light on the tangled web of emotions and the dynamics that have influenced Jasmine's doubts about her dad. Buckle up, the emotional climax is up next. When your wife said to you, you not the father, when you all get in that heated argument and she drops that bomb, what goes through your mind? When she told me that, you know, that I may not be the father, it wasn't that big of a deal. The only thing that makes somebody care in that situation is money. When she, when we wasn't together, and that's when all the problems came, because when we wasn't together, child support net. I'm like, okay, then that's when the problem came about to me. This is the big one, folks. The climax hits as the DNA test results are revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Taylor, you are not the father. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. Strap in for a wild ride. Right from the get-go, the court clerk rolls out the red carpet for the dramatic showdown in McKinney vs. Davis. Ms. McKinney steps up, claiming Mr. Davis is her biological father, a fact he vehemently denies, asserting he was clueless about her existence until recently, and pins the biological father badge on another man. As they set the stage for an epic legal tangle, you can't help but grab your popcorn. And guess what? It's only the appetizer. The main course is just around the corner. Ms. McKinney, you are here to prove to the defendant, Mr. Davis, he is your biological father. You say after your mother's tragic death, two recent medical scares of your own, today's results have become more important than ever. Mr. Davis, you say you are certain that you are not his biological father. You claim you didn't know that she even existed until a few years ago. You claim another man raised her. Cue the mystery music. Here's where the plot thickens with a twist. Mr. Davis's name is mysteriously on Ms. McKinney's birth certificate. He's baffled, claiming he wasn't even in the picture when she was born. This sparks a mini law lesson on paternity presumption in marriages, throwing everyone for a loop. Keep your eyes peeled, as the next revelation is just a hop, skip, and a jump away. So your name is on her birth certificate? Yes, Your Honor. So you did sign her birth certificate? No, Your Honor. She had to put it on. Her mom had to put it on there because I wasn't I wasn't even around or even with her. I didn't even, like I say, I didn't even know she, I even had a daughter. I she never Jake. even explained to me. I had Jake. So by law, back then, if you were married, then that's your child. Then father. that is your, you are the legal father I, to a child born in the marriage. Pretty much, that's what I was told. You might want to sit down for this bombshell. Mr. Davis claims his marriage lasted about as long as a sneeze. He recounts a jaw-dropping tale of returning home on his wedding day, only to find his bride less than lonely. Yep, you heard that right. She was with two other guys. As the courtroom gasps echo off the walls, buckle up because the roller coaster is nowhere near the final stop. Well, I was with her for one day. What? Yes. Y'all yes. lived together. You were married for one day. But they lived we together. together. The day we got married, I took off, we got married, and I had to go back to work. And so once I finished my shift off, my house was dark. And when I entered the house, I turned the lights on, acknowledged my wife, and she in bed with two other guys. <laughs> On your wedding day, you came home to find your wife with two other men? Yes, Your Honor. Talk about a plot twist. Ms. McKinney reveals a chance encounter led her to Mr. Davis, thanks to her boyfriend's sharp eye on a birth certificate. Their initial meet-cute was like something out of a feel-good movie, full of hugs and familial warmth. But don't get too comfy in that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's about to get a chilly breeze of doubt and confusion. We were talking about family. He was like, let me see your birth certificate. I'll let him see mine. I know your mama and your dad. I was like, oh, I don't know my father. I never met him. And I was like, yes. And they called Michael and told him they got a birth certificate here with your name on it. And he asked them, well, who's the mother? And they said Antigone. So the next day, they came down, we met. Enter stage left. Mr. Williams, who might as well have dad, flashing above his head in neon lights. He's been in the picture since day one, even in the delivery room. But hold your horses. Despite his frontline fatherhood role, the biological ties are as clear as mud. Just when you think you've got it figured out, the story spins again. You raised her. She testified that you raised. What was the nature of your relationship?
relationship with her. Been there ever since she was born. I was there in the delivery room with, you know, with, with her mother. Did you believe you were her biological? What did her mom tell you about her pregnancy? After we'd been together, and then maybe about six months into the relationship, she told me she was pregnant. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, drum roll please, but maybe keep it soft because this one's a heartbreaker. It has been determined by this court. Mr. David, you are not. <laughs> Can you believe we're starting off like this? Ms. Barrett brings a lawsuit against her father, Mr. Jones, claiming a whopping $5,000 for emotional distress due to a childhood she describes as neglected and significant absences during critical life moments, like her mother's funeral. And you thought your family reunions were drama-filled. Just wait until you see what's coming up next. Ms. Barrett, you are suing the defendant for $5,000 in debt for emotional distress. The defendant may be your biological father. You say he has never been there for you. In fact, you claim he wouldn't even show up for your mother's funeral when you were just 16 years old. The plot thickens immediately. Mr. Jones fires back, denying any financial responsibility and demands a paternity test, casting doubt over Ms. Barrett's claims due to some spicy revelations about her mother's past infidelities around the time of conception. The courtroom's about to turn into a pressure cooker. Keep your eyes peeled. You deny Ms. Barrett is owed financial damages due to emotional damage. Even though her mother admitted to you she slept with another man when Ms. Barrett, as well as an award of $500 for money the plaintiff stole from you. Here's where it gets juicy. Ms. Barrett dives deeper into her emotional turmoil, painting a picture of a father who was virtually absent from all the important snapshots of her life, including her birthdays and, most painfully, her mother's funeral. Strap in, because the emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. Never wanted to go to any of my birthdays. He claims he did, but he didn't show up to any of my birthdays. He wasn't there at all for me when I was a kid. Just says, because he's supposed to be my dad. All I got from him was that he couldn't go and to give my mom because he still loves my mom. This testimony hits hard. Mr. Jones defends his decision to skip the funeral, arguing it would be inappropriate given his current life situation, which stirs up a hornet's nest of bitter exchanges about missed funerals and lingering resentments. Buckle up, because there's more turbulence ahead. Not right for me to be there. I was no longer with her mother. This is my future here, and it would be disrespect to my new fiance of going to her mother's funeral, which she didn't even show up for my parents that passed away before her, her mother did. Everyone in the courtroom needed a moment to process this one. Mr. Jones shockingly admits he had doubts about being the father right from the start, spurred by the bombshell that Ms. Barrett's mother dropped about her romantic escapades during her pregnancy. The next part is a real mic drop moment. Why are you not on the birth certificate, Mr. Jones? Did you have- Brought her into my life. Take me back, when Ms. Barrett was born? Uh, no, I wasn't, Your Honor. I was with somebody else. She was not brought into my life. Did you know her mother was pregnant? In front of a party star hanging out with my friends and told me that she had to talk to me, which my daughter was in the back seat as a child. Talk about a plot twist. Ms. Barrett drops a bombshell claim that she was sold to her grandmother for a mere $100 when she was just six months old, thanks to her parents' desperate need for rent money. The audience gasps, and so will you when you hear what's coming up. When I was six months old, him and my mom sold me to my grandmother for $100. So him <laughs> saying that he didn't know about me and told her that they needed rent money, they were $100 short. My grandma said, the only way I'm giving you $100, give me that baby, because I was in rag, gave me to my Your grandmother Honor. and took the $100 and went home to their happy little house. Things are heating up. The tension doesn't let up as Ms. Barrett accuses Mr. Jones of being overly controlling during the short time she lived with him, treating her more like a girlfriend than a daughter, which Mr. Jones vehemently denies, emphasizing his intent to be protective. Fasten your seatbelts. It's about to get even wilder. $300 he purses. He doubted whether or not you were his He did say that, lie, that he didn't think that I was his daughter. He also told my mom that. He told my mom that he did not believe that I was, he can say what he wants in front of his girlfriend, but he's told my mom. I ain't never stated that. If I loved her mom, I, could, I left her behind and moved on with my life. You'll be on the edge of your seat for this one. The conflict reaches a boiling point with allegations of theft flying back and forth. Mr. Jones accuses Ms. Barrett and her friend of pilfering $500 leading to police intervention. Claims that Ms. Barrett fiercely denies. The climax is just around the bend, and it's a jaw dropper. Called the police and had her because she ripped me off $500. Her and her friend went out and bought new. That's I had to go do a couple of Aaron. So I left some, I left them money to get them something to eat. So I was gone longer than what I figured I was gonna be gone. I unlocked the door, come inside. Well, her and her friend sitting in the lift. Here comes the grand finale in a dramatic revelation. It has been determined by this court that Mr. Jones, you are her father. 
Ms. Pringle accuses Mr. Brown of denying their 18-month-old daughter, Tatiana. She is upset because he has ignored Tatiana's existence since birth. She hopes the DNA test will make him acknowledge his paternity and responsibilities. Brace yourself, Mr. Brown's retort is up next, and it's a doozy. You open this case against Mr. Brown because you say he denies fathering your eight-year-old daughter, Tatiana. You state he has acted like she doesn't exist since the day she was born. You want Mr. Brown to step up after today's result? Prove he is the father. Ms. Pringle emotionally explains how her past mistake of infidelity is affecting her daughter's chance to have a father. She breaks down, expressing the pain of raising her daughter alone, highlighting the emotional stakes of the paternity test. Get ready, because the emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. Can you tell the court what that feels like? I see the tears in your eyes. It hurts really bad because I have to raise her on my own and no child should go through that. Can you look at Mr. Brown and tell him how much this hurt? It hurts really bad that you're denying my daughter. A poignant moment unfolds as Ms. Pringle directly addresses Mr. Brown in court, conveying the deep emotional impact of his denial on both her and their daughter. She tearfully explains how their daughter looks for her father daily. Hang on, because what happens next will really pull at your heartstrings. She looks for you every day, and she she says, Daddy, every day, but you're nowhere around to help me raise her. She's probably like, where's my daddy? Nobody cares about me but my mother. The reason why I feel like that because time she was saying like this situation she cheated on me always a cheater will be a cheater. The narrative takes a turn as Ms. Pringle recounts the moment she discovered her pregnancy and informed Mr. Brown. His initial happiness turns to doubt following their breakup, complicating the story with their on and off relationship dynamics. Stick around, the judge's insights next are not to be missed. Went to a free clinic and I took the test and they said that it was four weeks and three days. Pregnant? Yes. And then you called Mr. Brown? Yes, and I told him I was pregnant. He was happy. We were together for like two months and we broke up. And so he was happy, but for two months, Mr. Brown, you were only happy for two months? We didn't have sex at the time, like the casino time that she got pregnant. Judge Lake delves into the couple's troubled relationship post-infidelity, with Mr. Brown's trust issues being highlighted. This insight into their personal struggles adds depth to the paternity dispute. Just when you thought it couldn't get more intense, Mr. Brown drops a bombshell. All your red flags, all your senses up. Spidey sense is on overdrive. Every time you got a call and then you had to leave the room to talk, even if it was a family member and you had to, I'd have been like, oh, you can't talk to your family member in front of me? You hear that, Jerome? That's what that I would have said right. to you, okay? That is, something isn't imputing, especially after infidelity in a relationship. Yes. Mr. Brown admits to signing the birth certificate despite his doubts, driven by his desire to provide a father figure for Tatiana. This admission reveals his conflicting emotions and the complexity of his decisions. Up next, the evidence showdown is about to change everything. You didn't come to the birth? No. So I guess you didn't sign the birth certificate Either. I signed it because I felt like I didn't have a father figure at the time either in my life, so a feeling like she has a dad to depend. Did you have doubts when you did that? Yes, but I felt kind of bad because I don't want a child to go through the same thing I went through. Both parties claim to have medical evidence proving their respective cases, setting the stage for a dramatic revelation. The anticipation builds as they prepare to present their evidence to the court. Don't go anywhere. The evidence reveal is a real jaw dropper. Well, this is a first in this courtroom. You say you both have medical evidence that proves your case. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Pringle, you say you have medical evidence that proves Mr. Brown is Tatiana's biological father. Mr. Brown, you say you have medical evidence that proves there is no way you can be Tatiana's biological yes. father. Ms. Pringle presents her medical evidence that links physical traits and conditions between Mr. Brown and Tatiana, such as lactose intolerance and similar physical quirks, attempting to establish a biological connection. Next up, Jerome takes the stage and it's hilariously enlightening. She's lactose intolerant, so is he, and other family members, and his lactose intolerant, I'm not. She has the same hairline as him, and she also does this squat that he- A like she, squat? Yeah, she does it all the time. What is the squat? Like, when I'm fixing on something, I'll... Let me see. I could do that. <laughs> In a lighter moment, the court laughs as Jerome, the court officer, attempts a physical squat to demonstrate a trait Ms. Pringle associates with Mr. Brown, adding a humorous break in the tension. But don't relax just yet. The expert's testimony up next brings us back to the core of the case. Jerome, <laughs> now can you squat down there like that? Exactly how oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, and then <laughs> I got a laugh to keep from crying. It ain't, it's not the same though. It's not the same squat. You gotta be even on both legs. Uh oh, Jerome, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got a heavy gun belt on. Oh, okay, okay. Your gun belt is holding you back. Okay, okay. So, thank you, Jerome, for your... <laughs> 
Expert testimony from Dr. Gator discusses the heritability of lactose intolerance and asthma crucial to the case's medical claims. This scientific perspective aims to clarify the genetic connections, or lack thereof, pertinent to the paternity dispute. The moment of truth is just around the corner, and it's a doozy. Mr. Brown is lactose intolerant, and her daughter is lactose intolerant, and there are people in his fam who are also lactose intolerant. Explain to the court whether this is something that is passed down, is hereditary. How do you become lactose? That's a great question, actually. So you're lactose intolerant. Your body doesn't produce an enzyme called lactose and lactase is what breaks down the milk. As the DNA results are about to be revealed, Ms. Pringle makes a heartfelt plea to Mr. Brown about her needs and expectations for him as a father, emphasizing the real-life implications of the case beyond the courtroom drama. The DNA reveal is next, and it's a real game-changer. What you want and what you need. You've been with Tatiana by yourself for 18 months. I want you to help me financially, emotionally, and physically to be there for her and show her what a guy shouldn't do to her when she grows up. I have to be there and teach her all these things. The DNA results confirm. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Brown, you are the father.